Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the word of God. We hope you enjoy. I want them to know that what little that I've had an opportunity to fellowship with them today, it's been fantastic. I have enjoyed it so much. I found out one thing. Uh, we were sat and sitting down at the Dairy Queen a little while ago. I said, they've got one thing in common I know. Brother Adams and Brother Beaton been there. Both of them is on fire about this Jesus name baptism and this one God. Hallelujah. So, uh, well, we all are to be, aren't we? Thank God. So let's just worship the Lord tonight. Lift your hands and worship him again as Brother Adam comes. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we do praise you. Hallelujah. I do want to tell you tonight that all that thrills my soul is Jesus. Praise the Lord. Every need is hand supplying every good. Praise the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you all that thrills my soul is Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ I don't know how I'm gonna to preach tonight but I'm just my mind is going back to our conversation at the Dairy Queen a while ago I'd like for you to take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 1 Revelation chapter 1 begins with these words the revelation of Jesus Christ if you've got a King James Version of the Bible like I have, and I hope you do, it the title that's there as a heading says, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. I want to tell you that when this was translated, that title wasn't there. If you wanted to know the title of a book, you would look in the first verse and you would find the title right there in the beginning of the book. Just like uh, the book of Genesis says, in the beginning, and the word in the words in the beginning uh, are the words Genesis. Genesis means in the beginning. So uh, you've got the title in the first verse. And the title of this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. There are some people that think it's the revelation of the end time, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. There are some people that think it's the revelation of the last days, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Some people seem to think it's the revelation of Antichrist, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so when I look into this book, I look to see Jesus. Praise God. How many of you have been wanting to go to heaven? Praise God. Heaven's such a good place. Folks are dying to get there. Amen. There's a country song that came out a few years ago that said everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Amen. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 4, and I'll take you on a tour to heaven tonight right into the throne room. Praise God. You've been wanting to go there. I promise you I'll take you to heaven tonight praise the lord revelation chapter 4 and let's begin reading with verse 2 and immediately i was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne praise god there were not three people sitting in the throne there was one that sat on the throne there were not three thrones set in heaven there was one throne set in heaven and one God sat on the throne. Praise the Lord. Verse 3. And he, not they, and he uh, that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw uh, four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiments, and they had on their heads crowns of gold, 
And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. I submit to you tonight that for those who want to take the things in the Bible that would indicate that God is a threefold personality and build a doctrine around that and take a word that's not found in the Bible to describe that word, uh, that uh, uh, concept, uh, and to call that the Trinity, I submit to you that out of equity and balance, uh, you are obligated to build a doctrine around God's sevenness and label that with a word also. Amen. Because this passage of Scripture says that there are seven lamps burning before the throne, and these are the seven spirits of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to make God seven persons, I guess, before we go on. But uh, we'll deal with that in just a little bit. Skip down to verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him, not three and not seven, him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, not you all are worthy, O lords, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. When this was written, there were not chapter divisions, and so we'll just continue in the next chapter. Notice this fifth chapter begins with the conjunction and because it's a continuation of what was talked about in chapter 4. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open, uh, uh, to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. This is without a doubt one of the most confusing passages of Scripture in all the Word of God uh, throughout the world of denominationalism. And uh, this is a passage of Scripture that has caused me much trouble over the years. Uh, but I do believe that the Lord has given me a vision into the throne room. And we need to pray that God will uh, illuminate our hearts tonight to understand what He would have us to understand. Let's go to God in prayer. God of glory, we come to you today in the name that is above every other name. There is the precious blood-stained name of Jesus Christ our Lord who bled and died for us. And God, I pray tonight that you would illuminate every heart. Bless us as we study your word tonight. Lord, we pray that you would cause us to be able to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. Bless and glorify your name tonight. We pray in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. In verse 2, it says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Praise the Lord. Uh, Sister Adams and I went a while back to a Christian bookstore, and we were leaping through some things. And as we were leaping through some things, uh, 
I happened to come across a book that had a picture of what was supposed to be heaven. I guess this scene right here. But it was not like what we find in the Word of God. What I saw in the artwork that was typified there, uh, there was a throne that was set there. And in this throne, there was a kind of an older God. I guess he looked like a cross between George Burns and Methuselah. And uh, then there was a younger God that looked something like uh, uh, the artwork where Jesus is depicted. Uh, and fluttering above those two thrones was a dove up there. Uh, and I guess that was the other person of the Godhead there in that passage of Scripture. There is only one thing wrong with that. Uh, and the thing that's wrong with that is that it's totally wrong. Amen. Amen. And you can't make wrong right, especially whenever you are uh, uh, studying the Word of God. And so uh, uh, we uh, 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 look at this passage and we see one thing in the Word of God. And we look at Christian tradition and we see another thing and we wonder how on earth could we get such strange pictures in our minds that have nothing at all to do with the Word of God. I'm telling you that if this book uh, is God's authority on reality, then this book is what we ought to go by instead of notions that other people uh, have somehow gotten in their minds. You say, Brother Adams, how on earth can it be uh, that it's one way in the Word of God and then you got all of these other kinds of depictions uh, of things that are supposed to be Christian. And the reason for that is because uh, down throughout history there are people that have brought paganism in uh, and uh, taught it as Christian tradition and it has nothing at all to do with the Word of God. Amen. I want to tell you tonight because I know it is true, the word Trinity is not found anywhere in the Word of God. Not only that, the concept of a Trinity is not found anywhere in the Word of God. You say, Brother Adams, where do we get all kinds of notions then that don't have their basis in the Word of God? I'm telling you that we can go uh, uh, back to the source and find... Uh, uh, where the stream flowed from, and then we'll know about the flow of the thing. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you that if you were to go to Rome, Italy today, and if you were to go to the Sistine Chapel, there on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, you would see all of those paintings that are painted there. And as you saw those paintings on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, uh, you would see that picture that uh, Sister Adams and I saw uh, of that elder God uh, sitting in that first chair. Uh, and uh, you would see a picture of this God. He's sort of reaching down uh, as far as he can. And here's a man, poor fallen specimen of humanity. He's reaching up as far as he can. You've seen the pictures of these hands that can't quite come together uh, uh, depicted in Christian art here and there, sometimes on the front of a book or sometimes uh, on a plate or sometimes on all kinds of different things. Uh, you might see this picture of this elder God reaching down, uh, and he's not almighty because if he was almighty, he could reach that guy. Amen. And, uh, and this man reaching up, he can't quite reach God. And it seems to be a terrible dilemma in humanity that something like that would exist. Now, I'm telling you this God, I mentioned a while ago, he, he's not almighty because uh, uh, he does not seem to be able to reach this fallen one. And then there are pictures of Jesus Christ uh, depicted there uh, where that he is anything other than the mighty one that he was in the days of his flesh. Amen. I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ was almighty God wrapped in human flesh. Uh, Isaiah said his name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. Amen. Uh, 
And the Bible says God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Praise God. Uh, and so uh, when we see Jesus there in the temple, uh, he's off to the side and he is making him a scourge of cords. And then he comes into the temple and he begins to turn over the tables of the money changers and chase men out of the place. Uh, he did that not with the power of God, but in the power of his manhood. I'm telling you that Jesus in the days uh, on earth of his flesh, uh, he was a man's man, Pastor Worthington, uh, and he was a strong man. Uh, but you see all this artwork, uh, and here is one that is uh, one and one that is uh, effeminate, uh, and one that looks sissified in some of the art there that's depicted. And if he came to you, he wouldn't have to say fear not. He'd have to say laugh not. Amen. I'm telling you, uh, oh, this lowly Galilean, uh, oh, he is, uh, oh, he might be able to open a few blinded eyes. Uh, he might be able to do a few uh, miracles, but he is not the almighty one. Amen. Praise God. You following me with this? And then uh, uh, you've got the third person that is not really a person. Sometimes he's a dove and sometimes he's a flame, but he never is a person in person. He's a personal flame and a personal dove. Amen. I'm telling you there is nothing as alien to the Word of God as to make God into three persons. Now, if you get to heaven and if you ever find yourself in that throne room where the angels of God are, are praising God and saying, Holy, 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 uh, I'm telling you, you will lift up your eyes and you'll see one throne in heaven and you'll see one that sits upon the throne uh, and his appearance will be like unto a sardine stone. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, I grew up in a uh, tenant farm house in eastern South Carolina, and uh, uh, we were very, very poor people. I think I told about that when I was here before. Uh, I mean, we lived in a house they called a shotgun house, uh, and they had built the house with the windows lined up where you could catch a breeze and a hallway through the middle of the house. And I think they called it a shotgun house because you could stand on the front porch and shoot the chickens in the backyard, you know, and they called it a shotgun house. We could have afforded screens, but we didn't have screens on the windows. And at night, my goodness, it was so swampy. The, uh, there was mosquitoes everywhere, and my mom used to burn rags in a bucket to chase the mosquitoes off. You've, if, you see, if, if you've experienced that, and... Uh, uh, sometimes uh, in the daytime, the gnats and the flies would be so bad you couldn't hardly stand it out there in the country. And Mama used to make raisin bread, and you'd reach for the ra raisin bread, and all the raisins would fly away, you know, and it's, it's like that. And uh, it was a bad situation to live in. And, and uh, in our house, we did not have a single piece of padded furniture all we had was uh, some old rusty bed frames and homemade mattresses and that kind of thing. And, uh, and uh, we had a table in the kitchen that my grandmother had made out of scrap lumber. And on the back side of the table, there was a bench that had been made for us children to sit on. But we called it a bench back then. But if I found out later on, it was a bench, sure enough. But we call, I grew up calling it a bench. Amen. And uh, anyhow, uh, uh, we did not have uh, a lot of the things that uh, people take for granted nowadays. And we didn't have jewelry in our home because uh, not because we had a conviction against it, because we just couldn't afford any. And I'm telling you, I wouldn't have known gold from brass. I wouldn't have known silver from platinum. I'm telling you, I wouldn't have known a diamond from a topaz uh, and all of that kind of thing. I grew up, and I started studying my Bible, and God used the study of the Bible to take me places. And I knew a few things about the Bible, but I didn't know anything about stones and 
jewels and all of that. And one day I was reading this passage, and it said he was to look upon like a sardine and stone. I said, oh, my goodness, I got to learn something about precious stones in order to know about Jesus because I want to know uh, about the appearance of the one that sits upon the throne. Pastor Worthington, a sardine and stone uh, is, is uh, a multifaceted stone. Uh, it's got so many different facets to it, uh, and not every facet is the same. Uh, you look at one facet, and it has this appearance, uh, but you turn it a little bit like this, uh, and you see another facet, and it has another kind of appearance. Uh, and so I look to the throne of God, and as I look to the throne of God, uh, I say, oh, my goodness, is it a sardine stone? Uh, no, uh, it's the rock of ages. Uh, rock of ages, cleft for me. Uh, let me hide myself in thee. Uh, no, I don't think I see uh, the rock of ages. I see the stone that the builders rejected. Uh, no, I see the cheap cornerstone. Uh, oh, but as I look at that stone, uh, and I see this facet, it looks this way. Uh, but as I see this other facet, he looks another way. Amen. I, I look at the one that sits upon the throne, uh, and I see that he is the everlasting father. Uh, no, uh, he's the ancient of days. Uh, no, he's the everlasting father. Uh, but as I see that he's the everlasting father, uh, oh, my goodness, I've got a dilemma on my hands. Uh, Jesus prayed to God, uh, and he called God Father. Uh, you look there in the beginning of Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel, and you will find uh, that the angel of the Lord came to Mary uh, and told her that she was going to, there would be a child uh, that would be conceived in her womb. Uh, she said, how can this be? Because I don't know a man. He said, the spirit of the highest will overshadow thee. Uh, I guess according to Trinitarian thinking, uh, it must be the first person of the Godhead, God in general. Uh, and so uh, I guess the first person would be uh, uh, the everlasting Father. Uh, but then the angel of the Lord says that holy thing, that is formed within you uh, shall be of the Holy Ghost. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, it's not the first person of the Trinity. It's the last person of the Trinity. Uh, but then Jesus says, I'm the first and I'm the last. Uh, and so uh, we're still left with a dilemma. But it gets even more complicated than that. Because in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, I read it earlier today. I'm reading through the book of Isaiah. It says in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called a Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, uh, the Everlasting Father. Uh, oh, my goodness, what do we have here? Uh, the first person is the Father, uh, and the Son, uh, the second person, the Child, is the Father, and the third person is the Father. Uh, but then Jesus said uh, in John's Gospel, One is your Father. Uh, now, how on earth... Uh, are you going to have three fathers? Uh, I just don't know. Uh, da, 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 I don't know how you're going to have three fathers. Amen. A man can have three sons, uh, but I'm telling you, a son cannot have three fathers. Amen. Praise God. And Jesus said, one is your father. And when you get to heaven and you see God on the throne, uh, he will be uh, the everlasting Father uh, as you look upon him. Uh, but then as I look to that sword and stone, uh, I say, no, uh, it doesn't look like a stone to me. Uh, it looks like a heavenly body there. Uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's the bright and morning star. Uh, no, uh, not just the bright and morning star. Uh, he is the sun uh, 
of righteousness. Praise God. Uh, praise God. Uh, but as I look at him a little more, uh, then I turn the stone ever so gently. Uh, I look and I say, oh, my goodness. Uh, what do I see? Uh, it looks like a plant, uh, but what kind of plant is that? Uh, I never saw a plant uh, so beautiful. Uh, it looks like the lily of the valley, uh, or is it the rose of Sharon? Uh, it depends on how you look at him, uh, whether he's the lily of the valley or the rose uh, of Sharon. Uh, but then I look a little more, I say, no, uh, it's a root. Uh, no, uh, it's a sprig. Uh, it's a root. Uh, it's an offspring. Uh, depending on how you look at it, uh, that's what it is. Amen. Uh, his appearance to look upon is as a sardine stone. There are over 12,000, excuse me, over 1,200 names in the Word of God that is applied to Jesus Christ, names and titles. And the reason for that is because there's over 1,200 facets to his character and appearance. Do you remember I said a while ago in the book of Revelation, if we look at it as a revelation of Jesus Christ, and if we look at it as a picture album uh, where you see him in this capacity, and then you look again and you see him in this other capacity, and then you look and you see him in another capacity, uh, he relates, relates to us so many different ways. Uh, that his appearance is to look upon as a sardin stone. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, as we look to him, uh, we see him for what he is, but we can't see him for all he is because our view is so limited of him. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but it just makes me want to shout and praise God over that. Why? Because he's everything it is that I need. One day Abraham was looking out across the Jordan River Valley and he looked and he saw the little suckling lamb drawing life from its mother. And then he looked on and he saw the little camel being nourished from the mother camel there. Uh, he looked and he saw the little calf being nourished uh, from its mother's body. Uh, and then his heart was filled with praise toward God. Uh, and he said, Oh, uh, El Shaddai. Uh, and El Shaddai has its root uh, in a word that means uh, the breasting one. Uh, oh, my goodness, God is not to be depicted as having breasts or anything like that. Uh, but Abraham was saying, uh, I draw my life out of God. Uh, I'm nourished by him. Uh, in him I live and I move uh, and I have my being. Uh, I go to him uh, and he's whatever it is that I need. Uh, oh, my goodness, in the Old Testament, uh, God's name was incomplete. Uh, Moses said to God in Exodus chapter 3, he said, Who should I say it is that sent me? Uh, and God said, You tell them that I said I am. Well, I am who? I am. I am is a subject with no predicate. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, what on earth are we going to do? Uh, we've got to fill in the sentence uh, every time that we have a need. Uh, and so uh, uh, Abraham uh, and Isaac were going up on the mountain, and Isaac said, uh, Father, uh, uh, here's the wood, uh, and here's the fire. Where is the sacrifice? Uh, and I, Abraham said, uh, uh, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Uh, and so the place uh, was called uh, uh, Jehovah Jireh, or uh, I am provider. Amen. Praise God. I want to tell you uh, that we've always got to supply uh, uh, the uh, uh, predicate to the sentence uh, because God uh, uh, just supplied himself as the great subject. Praise God. Right, right. 
What a wonderful thing. They were out there in the wilderness, and they said, Oh, there's death in the water. Uh, and God said, uh, I am uh, healing, praise God. Uh, and so he's our healer. Uh, oh, my goodness, Gideon. Uh, I was troubled about going to battle, uh, and he did not look for a valium, or he did not look for uh, some kind of thing to calm his troubled mind. Uh, he said, The Lord I am is my peace. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, David was concerned about Israel having a shepherd, uh, and he said, I am is the shepherd. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, uh, whatever it is that you need, you look to the throne, uh, and depending on which facet you look to, uh, he is everything it is that you will ever need. Praise God. Uh, there was a discussion in Jeremiah's day as to how sinful men could ever be made righteous in the sight of God. Uh, God intervened, and he said, I am righteousness. Uh, oh, my goodness, the only way that we can have righteousness is by him. Amen. And uh, I was reading in the book of Isaiah today uh, where it says that the Lord, I am, is our salvation. Amen. If you're going to have salvation, you can't work it up. Uh, if you're going to have salvation, you can't make it up. Uh, if you're going to have salvation, you can't fix it up. Uh, if you're going to have salvation, you can't do it up. Uh, I'm telling you the only way that you and I can have salvation is to come to the one that is the Savior. Amen. And we look at that facet of his character as he sits there upon the throne uh, because he's to look upon as a sardine stone. Uh, what a wonderful thing. Praise God. But as we look to that throne, uh, oh my goodness, uh, it gets complicated again because uh, I thought there was one upon the throne, but then suddenly we see a lamb in the midst of the throne. It depends on what facet you look at. Uh, oh, he's a lamb. No, he's a lion. No, he's a lamb. Uh, depending on what you need in the moment, whether it's a lamb or a lion. You look to him, and he's your lamb. You look to him, and he's the lion that causes you to have victory. Amen. The Bible says Satan goes about uh, in this world as a ravening and roaring lion. Praise God. Seeking whom he may devour. I used to have a teacher. I thought she hated me. Her name was Ms. Hyman. I'd say, Ms. Hyman, can I go to the bathroom? She would say, Gene, I'm sure you can. No, you may not. <laughs> the Bible says that Satan goes about as a ravening and roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you say to him, devil, you don't have any permission to do any devouring on me. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, well, why not? Uh, uh, why can't one so powerful as Satan devour one so weak as you and I? I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because we are keeping company with another lion. Amen. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm telling you, you can say to this world, uh, my lion can beat your lion. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I don't want to be irreverent toward God in saying this, uh, but I remember back whenever I was a boy growing up out in the country, we used to argue about whose watchdog could beat whoever else's watchdog. Amen. I'm telling you there's no argument about the fact tonight uh, that our lion has conquered the other lion. Praise God. Uh, we've got the victory in and by and through him. Amen. And so we look at this facet of his character, and he's a lion. We look at this other facet of his character, and he is a lamb. Amen. He is a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And in case you're wondering which lamb he is, uh, John the Baptist in John's gospel 
pointed to Jesus Christ as it came across that same Jordan River Valley where Abraham lived. Uh, and he said, uh, Behold, uh, the Lamb of God. Uh, he's come to take away the sins of the world. Praise God. Uh, and I want to tell you this, uh, that when you get to heaven and you look uh, and you see right there in the middle of the throne, uh, you'll see Jesus Christ, uh, the Lamb of God, with nail prints in his hands uh, because it came into this world uh, to take away the sins of the world. My goodness. But then John wept because nobody was able to take the uh, uh, book out of the hand of the one that sat upon the throne. And then there's the lamb in the midst of the throne that takes the book out of the hand of the one that sits upon the throne. You say, Brother Adams, that's mighty complicated if there's just one on the throne. I want to tell you exactly how that works. This one that sat upon the throne is God in all his great capacity. He's God in all his uh, more than 1,200 different facets. Uh, he's God, verily God, truly God. Uh, then as God, he needed the mechanism uh, to buy back this whole world and buy back the souls of men and uh, down under the earth, uh, in the earth, nowhere uh, was there anybody that was found worthy uh, to take the book uh, and receive back the title deed uh, to this earth. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, if a Savior was to come, uh, he was to come from the midst of the throne. If a, if a, a sacrificial lamb... Uh, a redemptive lamb was to come. He was to come from the midst of the throne. Amen. And this lamb of God uh, came uh, uh, there in the midst of the throne. Uh, and he took the scroll. Uh, uh, he took the book out of the hand of the one that sat upon the throne. You say, Brother Adams, how did he do that? Just like this. Just like this. Because there's just one in the midst of the throne. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Do we understand that? There's just one. There's just one. There's not two or three or more than three or whatever. And then it gets even more confusing because there are seven lamps burning before the throne. And these are the seven spirits of God. Amen. Somebody said that the Trinity has to be understood by faith. Uh, oh, my, I'll tell you what you think. That's got to be understood by faith. What about the seven lamps burning before the throne? Amen. I challenge you again. Uh, if you are going to take uh, God's apparent threeness uh, and build you a doctrine out of that, uh, you have got to take God's apparent sevenness and build you a doctrine out of that just for the sake of equity or things would not be equitable. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And so I look in the Word of God. I'm telling you, this got mighty confusing to me at one time. I think I almost had a nervous breakdown worrying about it. I went over through the Bible. I said, there's got to be an answer found somewhere. I got over there in the Old Testament and it said, Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. I said, Thank God you're one. And I started writing down references about God being one in the Old Testament. He said, I'm God alone, and there's no God with me. I said, Praise God. I'm God, and there's no God beside me. I said, Thank God. He's God all by himself. And then I got over in the book of Proverbs, and it said, What is his name? And what is his son's name? I said, oh, no, God, you're back to being two again. Then I got over in the book of, of uh, uh, Matthew, and there's Jesus standing in the water. I said, there he is, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, God wrapped in flesh. Uh, 
What a wonderful thing. Uh, he said, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, there he is, God in person, standing in the water. Uh, but all of a sudden, it gets confusing again because there's a voice that speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I said, Oh, no, uh, two again. Uh, and then there's a sign like a dove that comes down uh, and lights upon him. Uh, and I said, oh, no, three. But then the question from God comes into my mind, Pastor Worthington, three what? I said, yeah, three what? Three. I said, it ain't three persons because if a voice was a person, then every radio you ever saw is a person. If a voice is a person, every television is a person. If a voice was a person, every bird that ever learned to talk is a person. If a voice is a person, then all the doll babies with the little pull strings and the little voice inside of them, they would be persons too. So a voice is not a person. Three, but three what? Oh, here's a sign like a dove. A dove isn't a person. And a flame isn't a person. You show me a flame that's a person, and somebody's cigarette lighter is a person. You show me a flame that's a person, and your furnace is a person. You show me a flame that's a person, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown into the fire person. Amen. I'm just being logical here. Right. It's being logical. You apply the same logic uh, all the way across the span. If it's this way here, it's this way there. Praise God. Right. And so a uh, uh, flame is not a person and a bird is not a person. Otherwise, all the birds would be persons flying around living in the trees. Uh, chickens would be persons, and you'd be eating persons when you eat chicken. Amen? And you had roast duck or roast goose, it would be roast person. Amen? Yes, sir. Praise God. I said three what? Ah, one God in person and two manifestation of of God's presence and power. There's no problem with that at all. I go on over through the Bible and then I get to this passage that I read in your hearing a while ago and it said, and a throne in heaven. Thank God there's one throne and one sat upon the throne. Thank God you're back to being one. I, and a lamb in the midst of the throne. I said, oh no God, are you one or are you two? And then it just really blew my mind whenever before the throne there were seven lamps that were burning and these are the seven spirits of God. I said, oh no, God, are you one or are you two? Are you three? God, are you seven? Are you nine? God, i got to know this thing here is bothering me. It's driving me crazy. One day, Sister Adam said, let's go to J.C. Penney's and get you a new sport coat. I said, okay, let's go. I'd been studying the scriptures for three weeks, day and night, just studying, studying, studying. And I got there at J.C. Penney's, and you know how they do. They got these three mirrors there. Why they, I don't like it when they do that. They, they got this mirror in front, and you're looking at yourself. You're used to looking at this view right here. Then you got this view here kind of diagonally and from the side and you say that guy's stomach sticks out I know I, I don't like that and his nose got a little hump on it I don't, I don't like that I don't like the way his forehead slopes and and, 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 and and then it's got this diagonal mirror over here like that and you see another profile and you don't like that and between the two mirrors where they come together you see like 30 going this way and when the two come together over here, you got 30 going that way. 
all of a sudden, standing before that mirror, I got a revelation. I said, oh, uh, no, I'm not, uh, I, I, I'm not going to say, am I one or am I two? Am I three or am I four? Am I 34 or am I 64? Because I knew I was one man made in the singular image uh, of one God. Amen. I, and my children might call me dad. I, and my mom might call me son. I, and Sister Adams might call me honey. I, but that don't make me three. It makes me one. I, because I'm one in the... in the I am telling you that when you look in the word of God and you see the number 7 it always has to do with completeness it always has to do with fullness uh, what God is saying by allowing there to be 7 before the throne is God is saying there is sufficiency there is fullness. Uh, there is fullness of the Spirit. Uh, there's all you need in the Spirit of God. Uh, there's all the light you need. There's all the illumination you need. Uh, there's all the gifting that you need. Uh, and so you've got these seven lamps, uh, 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 or seven, the sevenfold lamp uh, burning there in the tabernacle in the Old Testament, representing the presence of God. Praise the Lord. You look in the Bible, and it says, Our God is a consuming fire. And you see God lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. How does he lead them out? To, uh, as a pillar of fire. Praise the Lord. Uh, and then you look there uh, in the New Testament at the day of Pentecost. No, let's back up before that. Uh, and then the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Uh, and the Word was made flesh uh, and tabernacled among us. Uh, oh, my goodness, God tabernacled in flesh. Uh, but then John goes on to say, We beheld His glory, uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Uh, oh, my goodness, that God that is a consuming fire was wrapped in human flesh. Uh, every now and then His glory would shine through uh, but then he uh, ascended back to heaven uh, and he told them to wait in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost was fully come. And the Word of God says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, uh, suddenly there appeared upon each of them uh, cloven tongues like as a fire. Now, I want to tell you this. Uh, uh, the Spirit of God did not fall in the nursing home. Uh, the artist did it to us again. Uh, these were young people there in that upper room. Uh, and uh, uh, they didn't have little Zippo flames on their head. Uh, the same pillar of fire uh, that led them out of Egypt uh, was the same pillar of fire that led them out of Judaism on that day of Pentecost. Uh, that pillar of fire came down uh, and a cloven tongue came over uh, onto this one like that. Uh, and a cloven tongue onto this one, like that. Uh, and it came over and it filled this one, like that. Uh, and uh, 120 of them were filled at the same time. Cloven just means divided. Uh, uh, it means split. It split off in this direction, split off in that direction, split off in 120 directions from the same source. Amen. I'm telling you what we see on the day of Pentecost uh, is what we're going to see uh, before the throne. Uh, and it's not seven. Uh, it's one. Praise God. Uh, oh, my goodness. It's not 120 in the upper room. It's one. It's not 3,120 uh, later on in the day. Uh, it's still one. Praise God. It's not uh, 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 later on in the week 5,000. It's still the same one. Uh, it's not 5,000 uh, plus 3,000, 8,120. Uh, it's still the same one. 
and millions and millions have been filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, and it's the same one Spirit of God uh, that's represented in His fullness before the throne. Praise God. Uh, but when you get to heaven uh, and you know God, you'll know God as one God. Praise God. Y'all ready for me to quit? Praise God. I got about two more things I want to say. Oh, my. Praise the Lord. I don't know how we got so confused about things being the way they are or about things thinking in all these images and things that we've got that have been handed down to us throughout history. When you get to heaven and you see the one that sits upon the throne, you'll see that he's got nail prints in his hands. When you see him that sits upon the throne, you'll see that there is a man, a lamb, in the midst of that throne, and that will be Jesus Christ, praise God. When you see the person of the Godhead, he won't be three persons, he'll be God in person, amen. God wrapped in a man, praise God. Uh, and you get to heaven, that's what you will see. Praise the Lord. Oh, my. I want to tell you that this book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And God is pouring out a revelation on this earth right now. Praise God. Oh, I'm telling you, there was a time I wouldn't have listened to what I'm preaching tonight on tape. There was a time I wouldn't have let you talk to me about what I'm preaching to you tonight. But God has put a revelation in my heart and in my soul and in my bosom. Uh, Brother Beaton Bender uh, 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 that uh, has come into the assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, God has given him a revelation. Uh, and it's the same revelation that I shared with you here tonight. Praise God. One revelation of one God. Praise the Lord. Uh, and so it is. Uh, I went, Pastor Worthington, out to California a while back. And in California, I went to uh, uh, Los Angeles and preached in a church there. And there were these two young Jewish men that were in the church there in Los Angeles. And one of these men took uh, Sister Adams and myself and my kids down to uh, Sunset Strip there uh, in Los Angeles. And we were there on Sunset Strip, and we parked across the street from a nightclub. And he said, you see that nightclub over there? I said, yeah. He said, that is the nightclub that's owned by Johnny Depp. That's the nightclub where River Phoenix overdosed, died from an overdose of drugs there. And uh, I said, what are you telling me that for? He said, because, he said, I wired the lighting in this building. I wired the sound in this building. He said, I used to be part of the... Uh, rock music scene in Los Angeles. And I used to be part of the drug scene in Los Angeles. I was part of a rock and roll group, my brother Joel and I. He said, uh, he said, but now, he said, all of that's different. I said, Joel, I said, Lance, what on earth happened? And he said, well, he said, my brother and I were raised in a Jewish family. And he said, when we were in our teen years, we decided that we had not found God in the synagogue and so God must not be able to be found in the synagogue and he said we became agnostics we said we don't know if there's a God or not we hadn't found him and so we're just going to go on and do whatever it is we want to do and so uh, they were uh, out there on uh, on uh, drugs one Saturday which is the Jewish Sabbath and one Saturday afternoon they're tripping on LSD and, and Lance this man here said to Joel, his brother, he said, Joel, he said, I've been thinking a lot about God lately. And Joel said, Lance, he said, no, man. He said, here we are. We're tripping on LSD. He said, we get to talking about God. We'll get all upset. And Lance said, Joel, he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, God, he said, I, I, I'm just convinced there's a God. And he said, seems like I feel the presence of God. And Joel said, no, he said, man, you, you're feeling the acid. He said, everything will be all right after a while. Somebody gets high on LSD, and they're high for about six or eight hours, and, and you, you just can't get straight ahead of time if you want to. 
And, uh, and so Lance got down on his knees and started praying and calling on God, and Joel got down on his knees at the same time. You know it was God leading them. But all of a sudden, Lance began to shriek and cry and said, Joel, I see God, and God is Jesus. Jesus is God. And they began to weep and wail and cry and scream and call on God. And in a few minutes, they were straight. They weren't high. And it takes you six or eight hours to get off of LSD. And they said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And they thought about calling the rabbi. They said, the rabbi won't know what to do. Let's look up a church. They got the Los Angeles phone book and started looking and looking through the phone book. Uh, and sure enough, uh, uh, they found the churches and they came to the A's first. And they found uh, uh, amongst the A's a word that was strange to them. And it was the word apostolic. Uh, they didn't know what that word was, but uh, it was the first church they came to, uh, and they were counting on God to lead them. And so they called a church, uh, and they said to the apostolic pastor, they said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. We're two Jewish brother brothers, and we've been uh, 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 tripping on LSD today, and we started praying, and we found out that God is Jesus. Do you believe that? And the pastor said, Man, you call the right one. Lance said, Pastor said, we believe Jesus is the only God there is. And the pastor said, you called the right one. He said, what are we supposed to do? The pastor said, I'll come over there. And the pastor came over and he talked to them about making sure they had repented and getting baptized in Jesus' name. And that week he baptized both of them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. A few days later, both of them had the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I'm not through yet. Less than two weeks later, Joel and another young man were in church at the altar praying. There wasn't a church service going on. They were just there praying. And all of a sudden, Joel got up and said to the other young man, Come on, let's go. God showed me something. Let's go. And the other guy said, Joel, are you all right? Joel said, come on. He said, I promise you God showed me something. Let's go. He said, we got to go somewhere. They went out. They got in the car, drove out of Los Angeles, drove through another small town, drove into another town. He said, this is it. This is it. Go down this street. No, turn down this street here. Yeah, right over here by this building. And they pulled up there, and there was a church there. They got out of the uh, vehicle and went up the walkway to the church and accidentally the door was unlocked there's no accidents with god they went into the building and the pastor was working in the building but suddenly he was aware that there was somebody in there with him the pastor came out into the hallway and looked down and he saw them he said young men can i help you and joel said no sir you can't help us. He said, but we've come here to help you. And uh, the pastor said, and just how do you intend to help me? And Joel said, before I tell you that, he said, I've got to say this to you. He said, until just a few weeks ago, I was involved in the rock music scene in Los Angeles. He said, I used to mix sound for a group called Kiss, and I used to mix sound for Alice Cooper and others. And he said, uh, he said I was part of that scene, and I was part of dr the drug culture and all of that. He said, but I want to tell you something. He said, my life has been changed in the last two weeks. And he said, I, he said, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. And the pastor said, what is it that you want, young man? And Joel said, I've come here to tell you that you don't know God like you think you know God, that you're not baptized like you ought to be baptized, and you need the Holy Ghost. Come on now. Come on. The pastor said, young man, I'm amazed at your audacity. 
He said, I've been in the ministry for over 50 years. He said, I've got multiple doctorates that I have earned. He said, young man, he said, I want to tell you, he said, I read the Bible in Hebrew. I read the New Testament in Greek. He said, I read Latin. I'm familiar with ancient languages of the scriptures. And he said, you mean to tell me what you're telling me? He said, I can't hardly believe that. Joel said, I, I was raised a Jew. He said, I read some Hebrew. He said, I don't read Greek and Latin like you. He said, but I know Jesus in a way that you don't know Jesus. Please talk to me. And the pastor said, I can't believe I'm doing this. He said, but come into my office. I went into the office, and the pastor sat down behind his desk. And Joel sat in a chair across the room from him. And the pastor said, okay. And Joel took out his King James Version of the Bible that he wasn't very familiar with because he had only been in the church for about two weeks. He started in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. The religious people said, What must we do to be right with God? Verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He turned over to chapter 8. Philip was baptized in Samaria in the name of Jesus. Turned over to chapter 9. Saul got baptized calling on the name of the Lord. He turned over to chapter 10. Cornelius' household, the Holy Ghost came on them. They all began to speak in tongues. And, and Peter stopped his sermon and commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And the Greek says, in the name of Jesus Christ. He turned over to chapter 19, and Paul comes to Ephesus. He meets John the Baptist converse there that have already been immersed uh, by the baptism of repentance. Uh, and he asked them, Unto what were ye baptized? They said, John's baptism. He told them who Jesus really was, and when he told them who Jesus really was, they got baptized in the name of Jesus. The Holy Ghost came on them. They spoke in tongues and they prophesied. The truth established in the mouth of two or three witnesses, and here are five witnesses there. Joel said to the pastor, he said, I know that it is the will of God for everybody to repent toward God, to be baptized in Jesus' name, and to receive the Holy Ghost. And he said, that's how I know that I know God. The pastor sitting behind the desk leaned forward, wiped some tears out of his eyes, and he said, young man, he said, everything that I have been studying for the last 50 years causes me to know that what you just said to me is true. When can I be baptized in the name of Jesus? The next day they took this pastor over to Los Angeles to the Apostolic Church there, and the pastor of the church baptized him in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And a few days later, he got the Holy Ghost. Praise God. In the last year and a half, I've baptized three Baptist preachers in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. All of them got the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. I am telling you that God is shedding forth a revelation of Jesus Christ throughout this world. And if people that have been in the apostolic faith will not get up and get with it like God wants us to do, he'll go out there and he'll find somebody else. There can be a rock and a stream, and the stream will flow around the rock and just go right on to its destination because God has a revelation that's flowing through this earth. You can either receive it and be part of it, or you can reject it and be passed by. But God is revealing Jesus Christ 
in these last days just before the coming of the Lord. I'm telling you tonight, too, if you've gotten a greater revelation of Jesus Christ, oh, my goodness, I'm telling you, you can see him tonight as the source and reality of everything it is that you need. If you need healing, oh, my, there's one facet of his character where he is the healer of our every infirmity. I'm telling you, if you need provision, he is the one that provides. In him, all blessings reside. Whatever it is that you need from God, you need a touch from him in your spirit, he's the one that gives you all peace. Whatever you need from God. If you need salvation, you come and get salvation. If you need cleansing, you come and get cleansing. I'm telling you, he's all that you need tonight. One more thing, and then I'm going to be through. The Bible says the heavens are his throne, and the earth is his footstool. That means that you and I are in the throne room tonight. Praise God. If the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool, that means that you and I are in the throne room tonight. In the book of Hebrews, it says we can come boldly to the throne of grace. That's his throne. Because there's one throne, there's a throne that's set in heaven. Praise God. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Remember the book of Esther, how that there were guards sat in the king's throne room. And how that uh, the king sat upon the throne. Nobody could come to the king unbidden. But I want you to let your mind just sort of run wild a little bit just for a moment or so. And picture a throne room and the door of the throne room swings open. An intruder comes in and he runs this way and he runs this way and he runs another way and he runs back over here and he lunges for the king and the guards don't stop him or apprehend him. Finally, he thrusts himself up on the throne and into the king's arm and he says, Abba, Abba, Papa, Father, because a child has every right to come to the throne. I promise you tonight that intruders can't come. But I promise tonight that children can come and you can come boldly to the throne of grace. You can see him as one who has so many different facets about him that he could meet every need that you could ever imagine to have. That's God's reality tonight. There's no need for anybody to leave here tonight with a need unmet. Praise God. I want you to stand to your feet. Bow your heads. I'm going to ask Sister Adams to come to the piano. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Lord, for this glimpse into the throne room tonight. Lord, we thank you for this revelation of Jesus Christ that is ours tonight. And Lord of glory, I just pray tonight that your hand would be upon every child of God. Lord, that you would meet each need, whatever it is. Some have come here tonight, Lord, bringing an infirmity in their body. I pray, Lord, that they would come and bring that infirmity into the throne room, Lord, to the throne of grace tonight. Lord God, some have come here tonight, Lord, knowing that financial difficulty is in their life. And Lord God, I just pray that you would give your people victory and Lord, be the provision and the resource that we need. God, some have come here tonight with a troubled heart and a troubled mind. I pray, Lord God of glory, that you would just move on the scene and bless and strengthen and help and encourage each heart. Whatever the need is tonight, God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would meet that need and bless your people.
I want to ask you, as Sister Adams begins to play softly, that if you've got a need in your life tonight, that you would come boldly to the throne of grace. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. You say, Brother Adams, God knows that I've got a great need in my life tonight. And I want you to pray for me in the privacy of this moment. I want you to pray for me. Would you just lift your hand up? God bless you, sis. I see that hand. God bless you. And God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. I see that hand. I see that hand, sir. I see it. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Lord, I pray that you would meet the needs of these that lifted their hands tonight, God. Lord, whatever the need might be. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Lord, that it's our privilege to come to the throne. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I promise you tonight there's room at the cross for you, for each and every need of your life to be met. Why don't you come and find a place to pray as we begin to sing. Praise the Lord. God will meet your need tonight. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Praise God. Lord, we come tonight and we lift Sister Worthington up before you. God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would touch her knees. Lord, we know that great facet of your character wherein you're a healer. We pray, God, that you would touch and heal her body tonight. Strengthen her, God, in Jesus' name. We ask you, Lord God, to touch and bless each and every one of these tonight. God, meet the need, whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is, God. We ask you, Lord God, to meet the needs of your people tonight. God, bless in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, bless and touch and strengthen your people. Thank you for the revelation that we have in and by and through Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you, God. Lord God, thank you that you're the one that meets each and every need, God. Lord, we thank you tonight that you are the fount of every blessing, God, the Lord of every situation, and the master of every troubled sea, God. We thank you, God, for your blessing upon your children tonight, God. Touch and bless this one that you love, God. Touch God and bless and meet the need, God. Oh, Jesus, we thank you and we praise you tonight, God, for every good and perfect gift, Lord. Oh, we know it comes from your throne, God. Bless and meet the need tonight, God, according to your will, Lord. Whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is, God. Oh, Jesus, thank you, Lord God, for the revelation that we have, Lord, uh, of the one true and living God. Hallelujah. Bless God and meet the need tonight according to your will. In Jesus' lovely name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Adam. For just stirring our minds. Giving us a glimpse. Giving us a glimpse of that yes, place that we all call heaven. At the cross Praise God. Beautiful, beautiful. 
I thought as Brother Adams was talking to us in the last few moments of coming boldly before his throne, I thought of a picture, photograph that I saw, and probably many of us that's here saw it, uh, unless you was too young to see it, maybe you don't remember it back during the very short administration of John Fitzgerald Kennedy as President of the United States. Now all of that important capacity, everybody recognized him as the President, and he was, and the awesomeness of the power that he had. And in the Orville Office, sitting behind that big presidential desk with the presidential emblems and flags and outside of the office, the security guards and uh, everyday people, I suppose you would say, would have never been able to get in to see the president. Uh, reporters sometimes would vie for opportunities to get in to see the president but it just wasn't an everyday thing. But there was a picture once of the president sitting behind his desk. And uh, there was in the room looking out from under the desk or around the desk was a little boy they called John John. And Caroline was there. They didn't look at him as president. They looked at him as daddy. There is a difference between the rest of the religious world than us that know him as our father. We can come boldly before the throne. He is much greater than any president or any king, for he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But I thought when I saw that picture that it was a good, very good illustration of how we, the children of God, can come into the presence of our Father. And to us, he's Father. He's all of these other things. But to us, he's Father. We can come into his throne. And you know, I believe that when Jesus teaching to pray, and he said, when you pray, pray after this matter. Our Father. And when he spoke to us of his relationship to us as a father, and we was his children, I believe he was saying, you can come to me anytime. And I think that when we just say Father and we recognize him as Father, it releases power that the world will never know because of the relationship between the Father and his children. Will you stand and lift your hands and let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. been so good to have been in the house of the Lord tonight, last night and tonight. Uh, someone has already mentioned to me about they wanted uh, the tapes of last night and tonight. And uh, whoever you are or whoever wants the tapes, and I'm sure probably the biggest majority of everybody in here or maybe everybody that's in here, the last time that Brother uh, Brother Adams was here. We, I mean, everybody wanted tapes. We use them just like tracks for a while. Uh, if you'll put your name on a piece of paper 
and uh, let me know if you want last night and tonight, if you want three of last night and three of tonight, and you're going to give them to somebody or whatever, let me know what you want, and we'll get them run off for you, and we'll have them here. I appreciate this man of God. I appreciate the word that he has taught us, the encouragement. It encourages me to know that God is moving among the denominal people and making something out of them besides denominations, making apostolic believers. Thank God. Lord bless your hearts. Everybody shake hands and be friendly. Let me mention this. Friday night, Friday night youth service here at the church, 730. Let's all come. Don't just wait on the young people to come. Uh, let's all come, okay? And uh, just have a real good time in youth service. Then Sunday morning is our Thanksgiving, uh, well, every day's Thanksgiving, but uh, before, the last Sunday before Thanksgiving, and uh, Sister uh, Smith and Sister Paula has worked today getting everything ready and cleaned up. Lord, it's beautiful back in the back. I walked back there before church tonight, and uh, I got the door locked. I don't want none of you getting back in there because you might mess it up. Just wait till Sunday and you can see what's going on, okay? And uh, they've done a great job, and I had trouble holding Sister Worthington down. Uh, but uh, she just wasn't able to be out here. But we're going to have lunch after service Sunday, our Thanksgiving lunch, and we want everybody to come and... Uh, just have a great time in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Invite people to come out and be with us. And um, the Lord bless you real good. Brother Wise. Right, right. Uh, Brother Wise's class will be in here. I think Sister Wise and the young ladies is going to be helping Sister Paula get things ready back there for us to uh, feast after we have our services in here. Uh, we will be dismissing Sunday, uh, probably about uh, 11, 15, if that'll be all right. And uh, everything will be ready. We're going back and have a good time. And I think Sunday afternoon, after all of that's over sometime during the afternoon, uh, somebody mentioned something about those that's going to be in a Christmas program get together, and they're going to start be getting those things together. We're going to have a lot of things taking place between now and the next month and a half. All right. Lord bless your hearts. Everybody shake hands and be friendly. Come around and speak to brother and sister.